Hello, my name is Anne Merchant, and I want to welcome you to today's event. It's a virtual screening and talk back on the amazing CNN documentary, Race for the Vaccine. Um, and of course, I am, as always, joined by... Hi, I'm Rick Lovard. I'm the program director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange, which is a program of the National Academy of Sciences. Yes, and we feel really fortunate to be able to bring this film um, and the important conversation that's going to take place today to all of you. Our thanks go out to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and Tangled Bank Studios. Um, they executive produced this film, and so they helped make this possible for us and therefore for you. And obviously, this is a really important topic to the Academy as well. Um, this has been an intense year of work for many people at the Academy. Beginning in April of 2020, the federal government government asked us to produce what we called rapid expert consultations. Um, and we did a number of those early on in the pandemic that was followed by an anticipation of vaccines becoming available, the creation of a framework for an equitable allocation of those vaccines when they were um, out in the public. And by and large, those that framework has been adopted across the country. More recently, we've been asked to look at, at ways that we can combat misinformation about vaccines particularly within communities of color. And just, I think, um, not too long ago, we were asked to weigh in on the ethics and the security around vaccine variability, variability and the, the uh, vaccine passports. And so I, for example, um, am sporting the uh, vaccine um, verification for the academy. We get these green armbands. And so when we are allowed back in our building, that's how we know that we've all been vaccinated and everyone has to have one of those to get into the building. And so um, we're excited to be able to do that with our with our green armbands. So uh, I'm here to tell you just a little bit about the Science and Entertainment Exchange. I want to start with a case in point of why the program exists. If you rewind time to February of 2020, uh, all of a sudden, one of the most popular movies streaming was a movie that was made nine years beforehand. Now, why was that? It was because the film was contagion people were turning to fiction to try to learn more about pandemics. So this is kind of a case in point of why our program exists. If you are a storyteller, you have a question, you're making a big uh, mass media project, like a feature film, TV show, a video game, you have a question about science, we will connect you with a field expert who can answer your questions. We've done this over 3,300 times since we opened our doors uh, on, oh, also documentaries, by the way. Um, so if you are a STEM professional and you are just hearing about us now because of the race for the vaccine and the, the, the film itself, uh, we would be uh, absolutely uh, thrilled to have you volunteer for the program. I want to also thank today's sponsor, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and let everyone know that we also get uh, major funding from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and thank all of the individual donors, especially those who joined uh, for this event at the supporter level. Uh, I want to thank our staff, Courtney, Jeff, and Sachi, without whom we couldn't make this event possible. And now I'm going to tell you just a little bit about today's event. Uh, in just a moment, our panel, uh, moderated by uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, will be up on screen. Actually, first, we're going to show you a clip. Um, and uh, at any time during the event, and some of you are already doing this, you can ask a question. That's going to pop up on my screen. I'm going to pass some questions along uh, to Sanjay as he is moderating, and then we're going to go into a formal Q&A at the end, which I will uh, be the voice of the audience. So I'm only there to speak for you. So please, any questions you have, uh, please ask them, and I'll, we'll get to as many as we possibly can. Uh, and now back to you, Anne. Well, I think that um, it's time for us to do our rabbit hole. It's what we do every week. And mine is, so there's a, a, an organization called the Science Philanthropy Alliance, and they've been doing what they're calling COVID-19 prequels. And really it explains the way in which the, the basic research that was funded many years ago laid the groundwork for vaccines that are now available to us today. So essentially these are origin stories. They give us insight into the people and the history and sometimes the really serendipitous discoveries that have made th this green armband that I'm wearing possible. Um, so I highly recommend those. I think that Sachi's putting that in a link for you to, to find a way to get to those and read them for yourselves. And Rick, your rabbit hole? Yeah, I just wanted to point out, you know, prepping for this event and thinking about uh, early days of the, of the pandemic, 
Um, a lot of us were going and hitting refresh constantly on that Johns Hopkins uh, COVID tracker. It now has a vaccine tracker that allows you to get incredibly granular with what the vaccination rates are in your area. I thought that was a pretty useful tool. I hadn't been to that site in a little while. And uh, so if you want to go check that out, I think it's a, a good a good thing to look at. Exactly. I agree with you. I do a lot of refreshing myself. Um, so now we want to ask Sean Carroll from HHMI to join us. And first of all, I would say he is one of our most favorite humans and certainly one of our favorite funders because he's been there with us since the beginning. He's the guy that said, you know, take a chance, do some things that might fail. We thought, okay, that's our kind of funder. Um, but we also know he's always incredibly busy. And so when we can get him, we grab him and we say, Sean, come on be on our stage and, and help us do an event. So thank you for being here today, Sean. Thanks, Ann. Thanks, Rick. Always great to be with you guys. Uh, looking forward to get back in person sometime because the in-person events for the exchange are, are equally phenomenal. Um, good afternoon to everybody and thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, HHMI, we're, we're proud to be a longtime supporter of the Science and Energy Exchange and events like this one. And we at HHMI's Tango Bank Studios are also very proud to have been part of a large collaboration among three production companies, two broadcast networks, and a lot of talented, extremely hardworking people that produce this film, Race for the Vaccine, which presents the inside story of the scientists, engineers, clinicians, and volunteers who undertook this heroic quest. So before we get to the conversation, here's a short trailer. You having difficulty bringing up this trailer? I don't know. I, I... <laughs> Maybe we should come back to the trailer. Let's I do think, that. We'll I think we might have to. Later? Yeah, right. I think so. Because I think we're all staring at each other thinking, is that trailer running? I can't tell. <laughs> There's a trailer. I don't know. <laughs> all right. Sanjay well, Gupta is going to say, what is wrong with these people? They are not very professional. And we would well, say, that is true. <laughs> there it is. Well, it's, it's also my honor today to introduce our moderator, who's already been mentioned, uh, who played a central role in the film. And yes, although he's a person who needs no introduction, he's going to get one anyway. Um, so I'm sure the thought has occurred to most of us listening to political commentary on cable news. Well, he's certainly no brain surgeon. But you may not know, however, that CNN's chief medical correspondent, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, is in fact a brain surgeon. He's associate professor of neurosurgery at Emory University Hospital and associate chief of neurosurgery at Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta. And for 20 years, Sanjay has brought his deep insights into medicine and public health, his compassion, and his empathy to the airwaves. Reporting from all over the globe, Sanjay has covered all of the major health stories of the past two decades, from natural disasters to man-made crises. And on multiple assignments, he was even called upon to perform life-saving surgeries. A best-selling author, an Emmy and Peabody Award-winning journalist, and a member of the National Academy of Medicine. For those of you aspiring to be communicators of science or medicine, you could find no better role model than Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Sanjay, thanks for all you do. The platform is yours. We were just talking about technical problems. I forgot to unmute. So, you know, just feeling right at home. That happens. Um, Sean, thank you very much for that. Very kind. And thank you for all your support for this project and everything that you do. I mean, I, you know, science journalism is I think more important than ever. I think everyone who's probably watching would agree with that and your support means means a ton. So thank you very much, a pleasure to be here with you and Janet and Dr. Graham. Also, um, I look forward to these discussions. We get a chance to talk a lot. Um, sometimes when you're doing television, uh, you have to give things into these digestible headlines and sound bites, but so much of our knowledge and our growth comes in the nuance and, and being able to have conversations like this. Um, for those of you that don't know, Dr. Graham, if, if you had seen the trailer, you would have met him in the trailer. Maybe we'll show that trailer later, but he is the deputy director of the NIAID Vaccine Research Center. He directs basic laboratory research there. I'm going to have him talk a little bit more about his background in a second because it is so fascinating. Uh, he is a major character in this documentary um, and that for lots of obvious reasons, but I will also add that throughout this pandemic, he has been someone that I personally have relied on often just to call and get my head straight on things and have him explain things to me, which he does extraordinarily well uh, with his language, with his models, something that he's been doing for a long time. Janet Tobias is a friend. 
um, but also an Emmy and Peabody award-winning filmmaker. She is the founder of the Global Health Reporting Center and executive producer of this film. We've had the chance to work together on other projects in the past as well. So just a, a real pleasure to be reunited in this way. So thank you both for, for, for joining us. Um, if, if that trailer comes up, maybe someone can just tell, tell me. But in the interim, I thought maybe we would just sort of start a conversation about this and, and uh, we'll go back and forth a little bit. Okay, I'm just told it's available. So why don't we, why don't we watch that and then we'll come back and, and, and have a chat. A virus can get from one corner of the world to the other side in less than 24 hours. When COVID-19 took over the globe, five heroic teams raced against time. We wanted to go just as fast as we could. To give the world a shot. There was never any guarantee that we were going to be successful, but we had to try. Race for the Vaccine, a new CNN film, premieres May 15th at 9, only on CNN. It was a it was an incredibly audacious project. Race for the vaccine. Uh, when you title a project like that, uh, you really want to deliver uh, on on what people are going to expect. And maybe Janet, we'll we'll start there. Um, when when did you even sort of conceive of of doing this? So if you go back to January of two thousand twenty, through now, at what point in this whole whole thing did you start saying, okay, this is something I want to work on specifically? I think February, um, in January, like some of us, I was obsessively following every tweet about what was happening in China, trying to really understand. Um, and then when they locked down Wuhan, I said, okay, there's just a gigantic problem. We've never seen this before. And, um, and then I began to think about how we would want to cover it. And um, beyond another project I was already working on, in, in February, I sort of talked to our group and we said, the great story is the vaccine. And so we started re researching it um, for six weeks and then began shooting. I, I, um, I'm curious, and we'll come back to this point as well, because Janet, you'll remember in the beginning, if we heard anything specifically about the, the timeline for vaccines, we heard years, right? I mean, the fastest maybe that had been done before was four years. Um, how did that factor into your thinking about the film? I think in um, talking to people at NIH specifically, um, um, I believed, I didn't believe that it was as fast as it was, it was going to be, but I believed that it would probably happen in a year and a half. Um, uh, and so I thought, you know, a year and a half to two years is a not unreasonable documentary. So we should go and follow that to conclusion. Of course, it happened actually in world breaking record speed. <laughs> And maybe that's a, a good place to bring you in, Dr. Graham. I mean, world breaking record speed is a pretty good way to describe a project that you worked on. Um, now, now that we have the, the benefit of hindsight, I'll preface by saying you were obviously working on these platforms, such as the mRNA platform, well before this pandemic. And we can talk about that. But in your heart now, at that point in January, when you first start thinking about this vaccine, what did you think was likely to, how, how did you think it would unfold in terms of timing? We've been giving a lot of thought to these kinds of problems over the last decade. Um, there's been a number of emerging infections we've had to respond to. And, and as we've uh, done more planning on pandemic preparedness and thought more about what kind of manufacturing platforms would be fast enough and what kind of generalizable approaches could be used across family members, viral families that, that could be rapidly applied. Uh, we, we had a pretty good idea of how fast we could go to get into phase one. But after that, uh, you really need data to drive what is possible after that. But you need to understand the safety and start to get a sense of whether you're making the right kind of immune responses. And so we knew that we could get into phase one in about 60 days for certain types of viruses. And then after that, it really required a lot of um, good outcomes and, and serendipity. Were, were you, so it was, I think, just about 60 days, right? If I'm, I'm thinking about the calendar 
sort of mid-January, you received the, uh, the sequence uh, of the virus. And I think it was mid-March, roughly, that clinical trial started. Um, that part sounds like did not surprise you. But what were those, in terms of the timing, but what were those two months like? I mean, for you and your team, was this just around the, around the clock work at that point? Or uh, what was going on? Yes, those two months were very intense for a lot of people, both in my lab uh, and at Moderna and in a few other labs around the country that we've been working with over the last uh, four or five years to, to prepare for something like this, uh, especially with coronaviruses. So it was a very, very busy time. And for those of you that don't know, again, you know, the collaboration between the NIH and Moderna is uh, what Dr. Graham is, is referring to there. Um, but it was one of the stories, Janet, uh, that you decided to tell um, because there were obviously these initiatives going on all over the world. So how did you, from a filmmaking standpoint, decide where to focus your attention? Unmute myself. Um, as always, as filmmakers, we're looking for interesting um, people to tell the stories. Um, but in this case, we also were looking at the different approaches um, to vaccines. Um, and there were sort of four basic different approaches. The new technology that had never produced a vaccine was mRNA, which um, Dr. Graham had been working on for a um, number of years. And so we looked both at NIH, who had partnered with Moderna or was, and also at Pfizer, which chose that approach. Um, and because Dr. Graham's lab had been doing the initial work and everyone else leveraged off of that, um, we knew that we wanted to do NIH. And then we picked Pfizer because it's one of the biggest companies in the world. Um, and then we looked for other approaches and we ended up with a uh, uh, approach in a tiny group in Queensland. Uh, we also wanted the opposite of Pfizer, a sort of small academic group. Um, and then we ended up at Oxford, which had a viral vector approach. And then in China, which was taking um, an inactivated virus among other approaches. So we sort of divided up the science, but also always looking for really interesting human stories around the science. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really interesting note, I think, for, for people who, who are doing films about, you know, hardcore science topics, how you sort of find that balance between, you know, really teaching people the science, making sure you have characters that can, you know, animate those stories in a way that's going to be interesting to people. And I mean, you're, you're, you're one of the, the best of our generation at doing this. So it's, it's, it was a, like, again, as I said, a real honor to be able to work with you on that. You also had incredible access. I remember some of our first conversations and you said, we're going to, we're going to be in China. Um, nobody was really in China at that point. You, you, how did that come about? Were, how did you develop those relationships? Um, China, we were with the China CDC, and um, that came about because we'd done a prior pandemic film, which, uh, which we were lucky enough to have um, Sanjay as an advisor on. And it was a film that was started in 2013 before Ebola and Zika. Um, um, looking at the threat of pandemics, and then as we were making it, both Ebola and Zika happened. Um, uh, and now it's sobering to look back on what's happened since then. But um, we worked with China CDC then, and um, the deputy director, George Gao, who's now the head of China CDC, and um, they were working on Ebola and on influenza viruses, and they really liked what we did um, in the film overall and with them. And so we went to them and asked, and it was obviously a very complex environment. And ultimately, we were the only long form film outside of China who was allowed. Um, and we were very focused on the science. So we said we want to start in January when the sequence was published and go forward um, specifically on the vaccines. And um, they never asked us not to ask any question, but mm. we always approached it from that specific lens versus um, other lenses that you could have. We, we've got some qu audience questions coming in about this as well, uh, about, you know, the access to Chinese scientists specifically. You said you were not told or had any preconditions on questions, but did you have to vet any of the material? Was it totally, totally free of any kind of Chinese interference? No, we didn't actually have to show footage to them, and we didn't for Unseen Enemy either, which mentions SARS in the past. Um, 
I will say that um, uh, that our producer there was certainly made aware that you know it was really important to do good work. Um, she was visited at one point by authorities who said, you know, you have an obligation to do, to do this well, and and you know you're being allowed to do this, but you have an obligation to do it well. But they we did not show them any footage. Um, and uh, any raw footage, um, and we did not, um, uh, they did not approve of questions. These, these mRNA vaccines, Dr. Graham, um, really seem to be extraordinary, and I don't want to be hyperbolic here. I want to be careful in how I describe them, but they, they, the clinical trials um, showed 90% plus efficacy in terms of preventing people from getting severely ill, hospitalized, or dying. Now, um, I guess six, seven months after they were authorized, there's been a lot of discussion about booster shots. Um, we, we, I don't think we know the answer yet. You can tell me as to, in terms of whether they'll be needed or when they'll be needed, but what, is your, what was your sort of expectation? Was the mRNA, from what you know, that, that vaccine platform, something that would likely need to be boosted in the future? There's already two shots, but I'm talking about after that. Well, the decision on boosting um, involves uh, two major factors. One is uh, how do the immune responses that are important last in the person? And the second one is how does the virus change over time? And, and so the, the, uh, the change in the virus over time and the decay of our immune system is, is normally happens is what will determine the need for a booster. And, and that, as you say, that is an active question being asked every day. So is there going to be some sort of criteria that you're looking at? Because today, as you probably saw, uh, not published data, but Pfizer released data saying a third shot could, could increase antibody, neutralizing antibody levels by fivefold in younger populations and more than tenfold in older populations. Uh, we're told that at the same time that we're told the vaccines are working really well. So, right. I mean, should, should I go out and get a booster or should my parents who are in their 70s? So the mRNA vaccines did work well. They're very immunogenic, meaning they elicit a, a strong immune response. And we do know from studies in animals, monkeys, and also studies in humans that a boost uh, several months later will drive that response even higher than it went after the first two doses. And, and that's something that's common to other vaccines. That's the hepatitis B vaccine is given as a zero one six month schedule. Mm -hmm. So it's common to have two initial doses and a late booster in, in many vaccine concepts. So it's, it's not that surprising that you would be considering a boost. And I, I think, as I said, it's a, a, a matter of both our responses and the changing of the virus that will determine the need. And, and I think what you're seeing now is as the virus variants uh, drift a little further away from the original strain that we are having uh, some people who were vaccinated develop symptomatic infection. And, uh, but what that means in almost every case is that they're developing the sniffles. They, they, they get an upper respiratory infection. They might have a headache and a fever, but generally uh, there are very, very few people end up needing oxygen or hospitalization and uh, very, very few people are dying. And so, you know, the chance of dying without a, a vaccine is about two or more out of 100, depending on your other risk factors. Hmm. Uh, the chance of dying if you've been vaccinated or even being hospitalized is more like one out of 10,000 or maybe one out of 100,000. I don't think it's been calculated yet because it doesn't happen very often. So um, the vaccine, uh, the, the virus is moving away from the vaccine immunity to some extent. That's why there's more infection in the nose. But the protection against the lower airway disease, the lung, which is what really makes you sick and, and need for hospitalization, that is still um, holding pretty well. 
there's there's a there's a lot of questions about this, and I'm sure Rick will get to some of them at the end as as well. But the booster that they're talking about is that the same vaccine? You're just getting another dose, or are these going to be specific to Delta or Lambda or whatever you know might be down down the pipe? Right. There there's different ways this is being studied. Um, Moderna did an extension of their original phase one trial where they boosted people with both the original uh, strain of, of, uh, and the original spike protein uh, by mRNA. And they also made a, a spike protein based on the beta uh, version of the virus. And, and then one where they combined the two and gave both together. And, you know, looking at immune responses after that and whether the immune responses become broader or higher. Um, all those things are being studied now in both humans and, and animal models. I, I, I'm sure we're going to come back to that point. And I, and I want to keep this discussion very scientifically based, but I, but I do want to ask Janet just about working with Dr. Fauci over this past year. Um, Everyone in the world knows Dr. Fauci now, obviously, and it's, you know, frankly, it's been tough to watch some of these uh, Senate testimony, you know, the, the hearings lately and how, how really combative some of this has become. Maybe, maybe not surprising, uh, given, you know, what's going on in the country, but I'm just wondering if you could talk about that same sort of question that I asked you about China. How did you first gain access to Dr. Fauci? You really had an extraordinary access to him. I mean, it, I, I think, if correct me if I'm wrong, you had an office essentially there, uh, close to where he is, to be able to capture a lot of this footage. What was that like? And for for the wider audiences, um, I'm the executive producer on Race for the Vaccine, so the credit for this film really goes to Caleb Hellerman and Kat Gale, who are two incredible directors, one British and one American, because we split the world. But um, during the period that this film was being made, I have been making a film with the co-director John Hoffman on Dr. Tony Fauci. I had the great good fortune to ask um, Dr. Fauci to do a film about his life before COVID happened. And so I was in early progress of that film and then COVID happened. And because of the Sanjay, this so unusual circumstances, I moved to DC because of lockdown and movement. and and being sure that you didn't infect people. And that's how I ended up being um, on, you know, at NIH regularly there because we were all trying to limit exposure to anyone outside of a tiny group. And because of that, I also had a little bit more access to Dr. Graham and Dr. Corbett who worked under Dr. Graham um, because no one was allowed really on the NIH campus because of, you know, concerns about, um, safety. And so I was one of the few people. So, um, and, you know, um, that film is a National Geographic film that will come out um, later this year. And it was the great privilege of my life to watch a incredible uh, health leader navigate through a very um, complex scientific problem um, and a very complex political divisive society. Um, uh, so, um, extraordinary you have to maintain your distance i guess as a filmmaker uh janet you know objective but but i mean you've you've gotten to know him really well and some of this again has, has just been i'm sure hard for you to to watch i mean he's he's 80 years old he's been doing this for a long time he's been accused of you know uh lying to congress things like that what's that been like i think um you know he is a master at focus um and I think, you know, once or twice he said, uh, I will say two things. Once or twice he actually referred back since he was born in 1940 when World War II, that in past times we understood that we were fighting a common enemy. And Eisenhower for history buffs and Montgomery didn't really like each other at all, but they weren't shooting at each other at the same time. They understood they had a common enemy. Um, and I think... You know, Tony has, through HIV and through his life, tried to build bridges between activists who hung him in effigy um, and figuring out how to incorporate them in research, how to build bridges between Republicans and Democrats. Um, uh, Susan Rice, now the domestic security policy um, head, um, said she had no idea what his political party was, nor did anyone she know, um, and that he... Um, 
the other quote I would say is he had a mentor, which I don't know, Barney, if you know, Sheldon Wolf, um, uh, basically. And he said, um, at the, literally on the election day when I was in the office, he said to his team, you know, once I was super upset that a paper wasn't accepted, they rejected it. And I went to my room and I was sort of my office and I was sulking and, and Dr. Wolf Sheldon came in and he said, Tony, keep your head down, do the work and good things will happen. And you know, good things sort of have happened. <laughs> That's what he said to his team who all broke in laughter on election day. So, um, so I have learned extraneous noise, cut it out as much as you can humanly do. Um, and obviously sometimes you can't, and sometimes it's been horrifying to watch. Yeah, no, I, I, I can only imagine. I mean, and you've been there every, every step of the way. Has this politicalization of things surprised you, Dr. Graham? Well, considering everything else going on in the country, uh, it, it's not that big of a surprise. Um, I can also say that I have no idea which political party Dr. Fauci is associated with. This is this is just not how he operates. And so uh, it's been a privilege for me to work with him as well. And, and he's had a big impact on my personal life, but also on just the field of uh, infectious disease and immunology over these years that is, uh, it, it's, we say unprecedented a lot this year, but it's, it's been, it's been a singular contribution to, to what we do in science. And the, the VRC itself, where I work and have the privilege to work is because of Dr. Fauci's, uh, you know, education of previous American presidents and, and just being at the right place and being prepared at the right time. So that's the reason we have the place where I work. You know, one of the, one of the topics that comes up a lot and it's, it's worthy of an entire uh, separate session is, is vaccine hesitancy. But Dr. Graham, what, in one of our conversations early on, you, you told me a little about your background <laughs> And, you know, um, what you were doing even during medical school, going back for the summers and where you grew up. And I wonder if, just briefly if you could share that with the audience, because the thing that you said to me that I never forgot was that if you could explain it, vaccines and how they work to the people with whom you grew up, um, you feel like you could explain it to anybody and convince anybody of this. Just, just for a minute, if you wouldn't mind, just tell us a little about your background. Well, I grew up in eastern Kansas. Um, um, largely in Olathe, Kansas, uh, but uh, moved to Paola, Kansas in, in my teen years where we had a farm. So I, I was part of the uh, rural Kansas farming culture. And, you know, the Kansas farmers are often skeptics and that you've got to prove things to them uh, one way or the other. And, and, you know, the Kansas farmers, um, which I consider myself one of, uh, you know, do a lot of animal husbandry. And so they also do a lot of vaccination. We did a lot of vaccination of pigs and cattle um, on our farm. And so they understand vaccines and use vaccines. But, um, you know, this, um, this is one of the demographic groups who've had a hard time uh, really accepting that this vaccine was needed. Um, so I would like to have a large conversation with uh, people who are hesitant for one reason or another. You know, I, uh, you may or may not know, but I'm also in an interracial marriage and my wife is African-American and and there's another large demographic group who is hesitant for a whole different set of reasons. But uh, the, the place where they intersect is that they, they have uh, a difficulty trusting institutions. And so uh, there has to be a way uh, to communicate and to, and to educate across, uh, you know, belief systems that include a distrust of institutions and, I think that's where we have to go. And, and uh, you know, if um, I think it's, it's hard for tr institutions to be trustworthy. That's what people do. And so we need to be trustworthy as people so we can gain people's trust and then try to communicate the right message. But 
Now, I think uh, there's a number of demographic groups in this country for different reasons who have had a hard time accepting the vaccine. I think it's such an important point not to you know, treat this as a monolithic issue, which is what I think you're saying, Dr. Graham. I mean, there are, you know, I think it's, there, first of all, there's people who can't get vaccinated, just they're maybe too young, and they may have other things uh, that, that uh, prevent them from getting vaccinated. But as far as hesitancy, there are a variety of reasons. And, you know, like I said, it's worthy of its own session at some point. I want to ask a, a question a little bit about that. This is coming from Kirsten, who says, how can I reason with a COVID survivor who claims that he does not need the vaccine because he has built up the antibodies? Um, sort of touches on vaccine hesitancy, but if you've been naturally infected, is that as good uh, protection as the vaccine? We're, we're in an unusual situation here because generally natural infection is, is creates better immunity than our vaccines. And, in this case, uh, we're fortunate to have vaccines that are actually more immunogenic and create better immunity than the natural virus infection. So there is a benefit to, to having at least a single boost uh, after you've been infected with one of the vaccines, especially if you've had um, an asymptomatic case or a case with very few symptoms. Uh, if you've had a, a very severe case, you're likely to have a stronger immune response, but you're also then, you know, may have damaged lungs. But so whether you've had a severe case or a mild case, it, you could benefit from an extra one dose at least of a vaccine. Should, should you get tested uh, in terms of your antibodies to to be able to help direct that decision more more precisely, or or just, you know, uh, sort of. Get, get the boost, you say, even if you've been naturally infected? I don't think there's any commercial sites that have the right test that you could use to make the right decision. There, there are tests that you could do in a specialized lab that would give you better information, but I think you should just uh, take at least one dose of the vaccine. That, that's, that's what I would recommend. You know, Janet, it's interesting because in some ways, as you say, it was record-breaking speed and the, it was it was triumphant, you know, the, the, the story in terms of actually having the vaccine authorized at the end of last year. But at the same time, I'm sort of tangentially talking about this hesitancy issue. It gave some people pause, right? Because they say, well, you did it so fast. I mean, did you cut corners, you know? Did, did you think about that with regard to the documentary? I mean, just... You're not, this isn't your job to be a PR person for these vaccines, but just from a communication standpoint. Now, I think um, one of the reasons we wanted to include um, Dr. Graham and Dr. Corbett was, particularly Dr. Graham, was all the early re research he had done. Um, but I will, I will say I was, not as, I was not as smart as I should have been, is that by the end of the time, listening to Dr. Graham and also listening to people ask, um, I haven't told Dr. Graham this, but I went into a bank um, even recently and they were like, the vaccine was too fast. And I said, but did you know at NIH, they were working on it. And I learned that from Dr. Graham. And she said, I had no idea that would change my mind. And I thought that's really important um, for people to know that there was lots of basic research. So to that, Dr. Graham is the better person to talk about that. But, um, but I think that's important. It was not just um, uh, you know, under a year that this was created. It was years of basic research by, um, by Dr. Graham's lab and some other people um, to really get to us, our ability to do this that quick. Going, going back to just after SARS, right, Dr. Graham, am I, is, that, is that correct? We're talking 15, 20 years. Yeah, you know, the first SARS came in 2002 and three, and um, after infecting nine or 10,000 people, it, for whatever reason, even though it had spread around the world, it, it did disappear and, and it, it no longer posed a threat to us. And at that time, uh, we did make a vaccine, but it wasn't a very good vaccine. And we didn't really have the information and tools we needed uh, to make a very good vaccine at that time. Before I turn this back over to, to Rick for some, some other audience questions, 
I, I am curious uh, a bit, and you, you touched on this already, uh, as you know, Dr. Graham, the news over the last couple of days has been about the fact that people who live in uh, areas of high viral transmission or substantial viral transmission should still wear a mask even if they're vaccinated. And the rationale as was described to me by Dr. Walensky was that there is emerging evidence that people who are vaccinated but develop a breakthrough infection may still carry enough of a viral load in their nose and their mouth to potentially transmit it to somebody else. Um, I, I, there's a couple of questions I have about that. First of all, I wanna know if that surprises you because my understanding looking at the data on the vaccines were that they were great at preventing illness but not necessarily at preventing infection. So is this new information or did we already kind of know this? And how common are these breakthrough infections do you really think? Because they're often described just as rare which I find to be some, you know, it's just very difficult to contextualize for people. Yeah, I think we need to work on the terminology too, because um, in respiratory diseases, uh, immunity to respiratory diseases uh, comes little by little ordinarily. So with influenza or respiratory syncytial virus, other respiratory viruses, you build up immunity over time. And the way that works is that the antibodies in your, your blood, in your serum, they have a very small gradient to get into the lung to protect the lower airway. And so the first thing that happens is you develop immunity to infection of your lung. And that helps prevent severe disease. Hmm. And then throughout your life, you get reinfected with the small amounts of virus that may cause the sniffles, but doesn't cause severe disease. And and that actually helps boost you, boost your immunity throughout life. And so I don't think what's happening now is it should really be termed a breakthrough infection because these kinds of vaccines were never designed to prevent infection. They were designed to protect the lower airway and to prevent severe disease. The fact that we did have a significant reduction in virus in the nose from these early vaccines you know, by as much as a hundredfold reduction from an a unvaccinated person, this was an unexpected benefit and a, a bit of a surprise that they would work that well in the nose where the gradient between the serum and the tissue is much higher. So this is not uh, an unusual thing for people to be infected after a vaccine designed to protect the lung. The, the, uh, again, and we, 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 so many of these points are worthy of their own sessions, but now the evidence seems to show, <clears throat> again, that's going to be published soon, that the, the amount of virus in the nose and mouth is similar in, in an infected vaccinated person versus an infected unvaccinated person. Similar. So it sounds like that's sort of what you expected, which, which makes me, as a final question before I turn it back to Rick, um, the, the mask guidance changed on May 13th, basically at that point saying indoor masking was no longer necessary for vaccinated people. I, I, I understand there's a lot in that, but at the time, what was going through your head when you heard that the CDC lifted that, that recommendation? Well, I think the CDC has a hard job communicating across so many different uh, places. And, and the thing that really determines your risk is your immune status, whether you've been vaccinated or not. That determines how sick you might become. But what determines how likely you are to be infected is how much infection is around you in the community. And, and Dr. Fauci has said this repeatedly, repeatedly, that you need to look around your local communities to ask how much virus is there. And so if you don't want to be part of transmission chains where you take a virus from one person to an un unprotected person, then wearing a mask, keeping distance and things like that that we're all used to are still going to be important. So, you know, when I think about this going out into the community myself or to the grocery store, when I've been inside, I generally put on a mask. I, I never stop doing that because I don't want to be part of a transmission chain that infects someone I don't know. 
And so I think that uh, the CDC has a very hard problem to balance the the needs of our economy, the needs of our health, uh, the needs of one community over another. And, you know, because every place is a little different. And, and I think uh, everybody ought to think for themselves, what can I do to reduce transmission of this virus within my community? Because maybe I won't get sick, but the next person along the line will get sick. And 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 I j just real quick, just to make sure I, I understood, with regard to breakthrough infection, which I realize the term is not not a term that you prefer. But if you had a hundred vaccinated people in an area where there was substantial or or high transmission, which means more than a hundred per hundred thousand people uh, per capita would be uh, getting infected, what? How many of those hundred vaccinated people do you think would actually have virus? Would 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 come back positive on a test? It depends on what their exposure level was. And one of the problems with this Delta variant is that it, it seems to create a larger, higher level of virus in the nose than the original ancestral virus strain that we have been used to thinking about. So uh, if there is a lot of people around with a lot of virus in their nose, uh, especially if they're unmasked, that creates something we call the force of infection. So the force of infection for, in that setting is greater. And so there's more likely to be infection if you're partially immune, and, or there's more likely to be severe disease if you're not immune at all. So I, I think that, um, you know, in, in vaccines, they're, they're not magic and they are not a, a black and white type of thing. Vaccines work by very subtle changes in the timing of the immune response. Hmm. So they, they uh, create a spectrum of immunity that people have to understand. And then people will take a spectrum of risks. And they have to decide what, where they're going to fit into the spectrum and what gambling they want to take on their underlying level of immunity. And so the older I get, the more careful I'm going to be. Um, if I have significant risk or if I'm around other people who have significant risk factors, I'm going to continue to be very, very careful until the virus leaves my community. Well, I, I, I follow the same sort of principles. I saw Janet nodding her head. I know, I think she does as well in terms of masking still, you know, even before these recommendation changes. And Rick, you know, I'll, I'll toss it back to you. It, it is interesting risk overall uh, and how we think about it. You know, you tell people something has a 0.5% mortality and there's a group of people who will say 0.5%, one in 200 people are going to die. We better be careful. You know, we better be cautious. And other people will say, so 99.5%, I'm good, right? What's the big deal? And that's part of the challenge, I think, as well yeah. with with uh, communications, Rick. So anyways, I'll toss it back to you. Yeah, I'd like to start uh, with, I'm just going to try to get to as many of these as I possibly can. We've had over 50 questions already. So uh, the question that I've seen the most is um, about generally mixing and matching the three different major vaccines, uh, if, the, if the panel could respond to their thoughts on, on whether that's advantageous or not. I think I'll let Dr. Graham take that one. There, there's been work since the 1980s on what we call heterologous prime boost, where you prime with one thing and boost with another. And uh, it can be a, a very effective thing. It, it often depends on what order you do things in. And, and so generally priming with an infection or priming with a gene-delivered vaccine followed by a protein boost would often create the very largest immune response. And sometimes priming with one thing and boosting with the other in the wrong order may, may, not, might, may not help you very much. And so in this case, the three available vaccines for emergency use in this country all are using almost an identical protein designed with the identical sequences and um, and so these proteins are very similar, and so you probably would get a boost uh, one to another. But, but the question is, wouldn't you have gotten the same thing if you'd just given the same 
vaccine. And, and, and the problem we're in is that you really uh, can only use these vaccines or know for sure about the vaccines if you use them the way they've been tested. And so the recommendation is still to use uh, the vaccines as tested. And a as we go along, there'll be a lot more testing done of the heterologous combinations. Um, so uh, how would you address people who are hesitant because uh, the vaccines are still labeled experimental? Yes, uh, these are regulatory terms that are somewhat nuanced. And so um, the similar uh, status in Europe is um, they're approved uh, with some contingencies, but they're approved. Here we call it emergency use authorization, which, which hasn't been used very often for vaccines, but the, the criteria for making it uh, authorized is the same as it is for uh, making it approved. It's just a matter of degree and timing. So the, for the approval, there's uh, an 800 page packet instead of a 200 page packet of information that the FDA has to judge and they've been followed for a year instead of uh, six months or something. So uh, the, the process for authorization and approval is judging the same types of things. And, and so um, it is a very subtle difference in my opinion, but you know, when it is approved, that means your physician can prescribe it. If somebody wants a third dose or a mix uh, a vaccine, once that it happens, your physician could, can arrange that for you. And, and so getting to the approval stage, I think will, will help some people, but uh, I can tell you already, we have more data on these vaccines than almost any other vaccine in history, uh, just because of the large trials that were done and now of the hundreds of millions of people who've been, uh, who've been immunized. So uh, is, is there any evidence, uh, and Carla asked this question, uh, that the vaccine behaves any differently for any subset of people, like based on gender or race or anything else? No. Um, there's, there's evidence that in some subcategories, so for instance, if you're very old, uh, your antibody levels may not last as long. If you've had cancer chemotherapy or if you're taking uh, active therapy for an autoimmune condition where you're taking something that, that affects your B cells or uh, the vaccines may not work as well in those subpopulations. And so, but in terms of the common demographics of uh, race or gender, uh, the vaccines work very well across any of those categories, which uh, are not very differentiating. Um, so we've, we've gotten a lot of questions for Dr. Graham. So uh, just heads up to audience members who have questions for Janet. But Janet, I think this one is one that I can throw to you, which is, um, how do you think that large institutions like the NIH can increase trust with marginalized communities and communicate? And also, I think, Dr. Graham, this is a good question for you, too. Oh, you're on mute. And I'm glad that the majority of questions are for Dr. Graham, because there's so much, I think, for people to ask and learn and um, on, on this. So um, in that, I think... Uh, I think that the NIH actually has a really great history if you look at HIV, where HIV changed the face of clinical research. Is before that, basically, patients were not part of the process of designing trials and, um, and um, ACT UP stormed NIH and had protests other places. And because of that, um, uh, gay men, people of color, women with AIDS were invited to the table, um, and then subsequently breast cancer and other um, groups were involved. But, but that lesson, I think, is embedded now in NIH in trying to really um, uh, bring in different diverse groups to trials and to the design of trials. And in that, I saw in my year at NIH, in 
they actually um, asked Moderna to slow down because they were not enrolling enough African-American participants in their phase three trial. Um, and it was NIH that specifically said, you must do this because we must have representation across um, the different demographics in the US and particularly in COVID when Latinx and African-American populations were so heavily hit. Um, and Dr. Grant, since you've lived this for a longer time. Yes, I was very proud of Moderna for uh, really focusing in on uh, minority community participants. You know, after the end of August, pretty much, uh, it was focused entirely on uh, minority communities to, to have the data we needed to convince people that it, the vaccine really was working in all people groups. Um, you know, you cannot gain trust quickly. It's not something that happens quickly. So if you're in an emergency situation trying to gain trust, you're not going to be very successful. And it takes a long time in relationships and uh, to, to be shown trustworthy. And so there needs to be an ongoing conversation and communication and engagement uh, that that uh, doesn't just happen in the middle of an emergency to, to re restore some of the, the trust. And you have to continue to show yourself trustworthy to really gain this trust. I, I just don't think there's any other way around it. The other, the other uh, big thing that has to happen that there is emphasis and Dr. Collins is particularly interested in trying to make this happen, but we need more minority uh, researchers and physicians in, in places of power, not just in places of training, but in places of power as faculty members, as deans of schools and heads of medical schools and heads of companies. You need uh, all people represented at those levels of power who can speak uh, from a, a better place to communities that may or may not trust uh, people that look like me. It kills me to say this. We are out of time. Janet, I want to ask one question that I think is very, very relevant. Paula, uh, I know people can see the movie through the link from this event through Friday, but where will they be able to see the movie after Friday? In North America, it's on CNN Go. Um, so you can see it on CNN Go. Um, and if anyone is in any other place in the world, it's streaming on BBC, who is our other broadcast main broadcast partner. And it's actually moving around the world. It was just aired in France on Arte. And it's sort of airing on every continent on different broadcasters. So if there is a non-North American, um, feel free to get my email or text me and I will um, tell you where you can watch it. Excellent. And we're going to bring Anne back on now. Uh, so many amazing questions. This is just, I, I don't know if it's going to take Anne a second to get on. I'm just going to ask uh, uh, Dr. Graham, how, what are some, just a couple of things you would do to protect children under 12 right now, if assuming the parents have been vaccinated? Well, that's a hard question. Um, you know, we've had our children cooped up at home for a year and a half and I have a six-year-old granddaughter who's busting loose to go do things and swim and be social. So it's, uh, if children are playing with other children, uh, you know, there's probably going to still continue to be some transmission. I don't, I don't really have a good solution for that uh, until we um, have a higher level of immunity in our community. So now we're definitely, definitely over time. And thank you for um, all the great discussion today. Thank you to Sanjay Gupta. Thank you, uh, HHMI. Um, and um, I guess we are not bringing Anne on. I don't know if Anne can come on. Usually she, we usually bring close this together, but I will say, um, please tune in next week. We're gonna have a, a fun event all about uh, space. And uh, it's going to be about specifically finding life off of Earth. 
and we are going to be uh, on air with some uh, JPL scientists, uh, including our much beloved Tracy Drain, who will be helping us uh, organize that event. Um, you know, thanks to everybody, and I guess we'll see you next week. And uh, we really appreciate it.